tonight. Father God, we come tonight and just thank you and praise you tonight. We just ask you right now to bless and be with each and every person that's here tonight. Be with each family that's represented. Father, we ask you to uh, touch and be with those that are sick. Father, those that are healing in their bodies. Father, and those that uh, have upcoming appointments and procedures. Father, we're going to ask you to be with the doctors and the nurses and the many that will be treating them, Father, and just give them wisdom and discernment tonight. And we're just going to ask you to bless this service and to be with each of us and open us up to uh, hear you speaking to us, Father. We're going to ask you now to bless the offering, bless the gift, and the giver alike. And we just thank you tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
but the blood of Jesus for my part in this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing is my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh But the blood of Jesus, not a good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Whoa, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of When I was but a child, I let it stay just pushed away for a long, long while. Until one dark and stormy night, the Spirit made its call. It gave me faith to believe, and I believe it all. Yes, I believe that Jesus' blood has washed away my sins. And I believe the Spirit seeks to guide me from within. Oh, I believe my soul is saved, and when I hear the call, I rise to live beyond the grave. Oh, I believe it all.
things that Jesus said I can't quite understand But I know he included me in his salvation plan And I believe i go to heaven when I receive the call I'm going to live on Zion's hill, oh I believe it all Yes, I believe that Jesus' blood can wash away my sins And I believe the Spirit seeks to guide me from within Oh, I believe my soul is safe and when I receive the call I rise to live beyond the grave Oh, I believe it all go by a heavy burden Neath the load of guilt and shame then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same he touched me oh he touched me And oh, the joy that floods my soul Something happened And now I know He touched me and made me whole Since I met this blessed Savior Since he cleansed and made me whole I will never cease to praise him I'll shout it while he turns Touch me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole he touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul something happened and now I know He touched me and made me whole. He touched me and made me whole. As the world looks upon me, As I struggle along They say I have nothing But they are so wrong In my heart I'm rejoicing How I wish they could see Thank you Lord For your blessings on me There's a roof up above me I've a good place to sleep There is food on my table And shoes on my feet You gave me your love, Lord And a fine family For your blessings on me 
Now I know I'm not wealthy And these clothes, they're not new I don't have much money But Lord, I have you And to me, that's all that matters Though the world cannot see Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. There is food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Troubles and 
Turn to your Bibles to John chapter 3. We're going to be in John chapter 3, verses 16 through, I believe, about verse 21. Now, um, Velma was concerned that I, was, that I wasn't going to preach. I may have to preach back here, right behind. Since everybody's sitting in the back, preach back here from the back row and maybe work my way forward instead of standing up there because um, th- these fine young people up here, you know they don't have any issues. So they're <laughs> All right. <laughs> So John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 16. But I do want to, once I get everything pulled up here, on my little, uh, my little m- motion here, uh, I do want to talk just a minute about this morning and about our sermon this morning, just kind of recap things. Because this morning we talked a lot about God's timing and God's timing being perfect and it having to be perfect. And we've got to have a kind of a fundamental understanding of God's timing in order to really understand a lot of the different concepts of God. And just to be honest with you, we are never going to understand everything there is about God's timing, about God's plan, about God's Word. We're not going to understand it all. It's beyond our comprehension. We can only understand so much. And our understanding will be much, much better once we get to heaven. The key is we've got to make it there, don't we? We've got, to, we've got to make it to that point. But um, everything, everything depends on God's timing. All of creation itself depends on what God's timing is. When God created this universe, it was dependent on God's timing and how God timed things. And, and, and our salvation is dependent on God's timing. And Jesus Christ and His coming, like we talked about this morning, is dependent on God's timing and how God timed things and how God put everything together. And we, we, we begin began to talk about that this morning, but tonight I want to kind of dig a little bit deeper into one specific um, area of God's timing, and that being Jesus Christ and, 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 his, and, his, and his basically His death and His burial and His resurrection and, and the gift that God gave us through Jesus Christ. And you all know uh, John 3.16, we read that verse all the time, and we, we memorize that verse as kids, and it's one of those verses, it's one of our life verses, but a lot of times we leave out the rest of the narrative. We leave out the rest of the story. We're pretty good about picking up the beginning of it, talking a little bit about Nicodemus, but we don't um, finish it out and finish out the whole narrative. We, we get to John 3, 16, we stop there. But there's more to it. There's more to it that Jesus is trying to tell us and to tell the people. And that's kind of what we're going to dig into a little bit tonight is kind of the rest of the story there. And we're going to kind of look at that narrative as a whole. And John 3.16 is the the, kind of a, um, I guess, a key passage and kind of the one thing that hinges it all together and pulls it all together. But there's, like I said, there's a lot more to it. And we're going to look at that. And and what we're going to look at, uh, the concept I want you to think about is, is how we love the darkness and that will become clear as we go through it is how we love the darkness and, 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 and what Jesus is saying there so have you found John 3 in your Bibles 
A couple of you. All right. If you're able to, stand with me. I'm going to read verses 16 through 21, and they'll have it back here too as well. So uh, starting in verse 16, it says this, and you all know this, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Him stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And he says in verse 19, This is the verdict. You hear that? This is the verdict is what Jesus is saying. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. You want to know why people won't come to church when you ask them to? You want to know why people don't want to listen to you when you, when you want to tell them about Jesus? It's because they love the darkness and they're afraid to come into the light because it will expose the darkness of their life and their heart and the sin that's within them. It will expose that and they won't come out. And verse 21, Jesus says, But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Father, we come again and I just thank you and praise you this evening. I just ask you to continue to be with us and strive with us and just help us tonight to understand your word and just to give me the words to speak tonight, Father. And just help us to uh, remove anything that would be a stumbling block, Father. Anything that would stand in the way of you speaking to us and our soul tonight, Father. Guide us and help us and we just thank you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm dried out, so I got to get a drink of water here. So, we read here um, the part, the end of the narrative, and we read um, this section here of this overall, just larger uh, narrative, and it is a somewhat familiar because we've heard about Nicodemus. Who's who's heard about Nicodemus? Raise your hand if you've heard about Nicodemus before. That's most everybody in here. We've heard about Nicodemus, and we've heard about how he came to Jesus, and, and they went through all this big uh, um, long exchange here, but we we have not really ever, I don't think I've ever preached it and dug deep into this at all uh, since I've been here. We've not really looked at it very much, and I think overall we've not really looked at a whole lot of it. It. You know, there are certain aspects of it we've looked at, but we've not looked at it as a whole. But um, we need to know some things about Nicodemus to begin with. In verse 1, Jesus introduces us to him, and he says here, he says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. And we know that Nicodemus was an important high-ranking Jewish official, but we don't know how high-ranking he is because we never really talked about it. I've never heard anybody really uh, tell us exactly um, what, a, what the Jewish ruling council was. And if you, if you look it up and you start thinking about this ruling council, you had the high priest and then you had the ruling council. So uh, they were basically uh, the second in command, I guess, of the Jewish um, tradition behind the high priest. And that was kind of the ruling council there. And the high priest led the ruling council, and he was like the leader, and then they had those. Um, and, but Nicodemus, so he was a member of this ruling council. He was a high-ranking Jewish official, but he also had another role. And it was another very important role. And Jesus exposes that in verse 10. He says... To Nicodemus, he says, you are Israel's teacher. Uh, and King James says, the master of Israel. And he says, uh, and you do not understand these things. And the thing about that that we need to understand is what it means to be Israel's teacher or the master of, of Israel. And what he's telling him and as he's revealing to us what Nicodemus' role was, he was the head teacher of all of Israel. He was the theologian of all of Israel. He was the one that taught the priests and the scribes and, and the rest of the ruling council. He was the one that would advise the high priest on, on, on religious matters. He, that's how important he was. So if you want to think about it, he was kind of like the advisor, the religious advisor to all of Israel. And he's coming to Jesus at night in the darkness to get his advice on things. So, that tells us who Nicodemus is. But Nicodemus is also, I'm going to give him some credit here. Nicodemus was a wise man too. 
Now remember we uh, talked uh, last week, I believe, about wisdom and about intelligence and the difference between the two. Nicodemus had a level of wisdom. Now Nicodemus um, wasn't ready to accept Jesus Christ as a Messiah, as the Savior at this point, but he understood that Jesus was sent from God. He understood that only one that is sent from God could do the things that Jesus could do and know the things that Jesus knew. So he had a, a quite a bit of wisdom about him. And he, this is what he says in verse 2. It says, He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. He says, For no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Do you see that? So he's, we've got Nicodemus here and he's coming to Jesus. And he's coming under the cloak of darkness, which we focus a lot on, which we should, because um, and that kind of tells us about uh, a couple of things. It tells us that Nicodemus isn't ready to accept Jesus, but also tells us about the climate and, uh, and kind of the turmoil and all the things that were surrounding Jesus at that time. If Nicodemus would have came to Jesus during the day and started asking Jesus his advice about things, it doesn't matter if he is the advisor to all of Israel or not, things were not going to go well for Nicodemus. Because you've got to think, later on, they killed Jesus. And if they're going to kill the Son of God, just think what they would do to just this, this, uh, this other priest or this ruling council member. And so he's sneaking around at night coming to see Jesus. He's afraid, really, is what he is. And that's why he came at night. And what we've got to think about here is we've got to relate this to how, how people act today. Because Nicodemus was doing something. He was seeking. He was searching. He was looking for God. He was looking for answers. But he was doing it from kind of the shadows. We have a lot of people that do that, don't they? We've got a lot of people that won't set foot in the church house, but they'll kind of lurk in the shadows, won't they? And they'll ask questions. We've got a lot of people that won't come to the church, but they'll, they'll watch the little video that we do. Or they'll comment on something that we put on the, the Facebook thing, or they'll do those kinds of things. It's because they're searching. They're looking. They're seeking. And what are, we, what are they going to find when they, find, when, the, when they come to us? That's the question. What are they going to find? Are they going to find someone who can give them the answers and point them to Christ? Are they going to find somebody that's just as messed up and as lost and out there as they are? You know... And I think a lot of times, too, we get frustrated, don't we? When we have family and friends and people that we've talked to and we feel like we've talked to them until we're blue in the face. And nothing we say, nothing we do will convince them. We get frustrated, don't we? And we get to the point where we just want to kind of give up on them. Say, ah, right, well, go on and do what you want. A lot of times they'll, they'll react to us too. They'll, uh, you know, if, if they see us coming, they'll, they'll duck down and hide. And, uh, or if they, see us, uh, if they see us pull up in the driveway, you'll see this looking through the mini blinds and poof. <laughs> and they'll be saying, hide, hide the kids, they're coming. They'll hide from us, they'll avoid us. Or they'll be rude and mean and nasty, won't they? Slam the door in your face, all those kinds of things. Have you ever thought about why they do that? Because we can just say, ah, oh, they're just being rude and nasty and mean. I'll well, tell you, it's a, it's a fear reaction. They are afraid. They're not afraid of you. They're afraid of God. They're afraid of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is what they're afraid of. They have all these different kinds of conflicts going on within them. Think about your life before, before you met Jesus. And think about how you reacted to people when they wanted to tell you about Jesus. It wasn't, probably wasn't that much different. Now, you may not have been mean or rude or anything like that. Or you may have. I don't know. But don't, you had those same similar reactions. And why did you have those reactions? Because you were afraid. You were afraid to give your heart to the Lord because of all the things and all the, the, the lies that the world has fed, fed them and it's fed you. All the things they said, you know, oh, people make fun of you. Oh, it's just a, a bunch of garbage. Or, oh, that's fake. Or, oh, that's not real. Or this or that. Or, oh, my favorite one is, oh, you can't have no fun if you do that. Really? What kind of fun are you having? Because it really, if you think about it, when you wake up, it ain't much fun. 
when you look around, it ain't much fun. No, fun going to come that way. I, we talk about things like joy. And there's a big difference between joy and fun. Anybody can go out and have a little fun every once in a while. You know, we do things that are fun. But joy is kind of a state of being. It's just kind of how we are. That's fun. You, wanna, you want to do something fun? How about riding through the clouds with Jesus? Now, that'll be fun. But they'll believe these lies. And then... They'll also, they're conflicted and they're running from God. And it sounds kind of crazy, but they're under so much conviction knowing that if they die, they're going to die apart from God and they're going to spend eternity in hell that they're afraid and instead of running towards God, they'll run away from God. They think if they run away, it'll just go away. That's not how it works, but that's the way they do. That's how they respond to it. And then they respond to us in anger or something when we come and we try to share. But we can't be that way. Even when they're at their worst, we still have to be loving and kind and accepting. We still have to be a Christian. We still have to be that witness because they're going to come, there's going to come a time when they're going to come to us at night like Nicodemus did and they're going to ask their questions. And we're going to have to be there to answer those questions and they're going to have to be able to feel comfortable coming to us to ask those questions. And I'm going to tell you, some of the hardest people to share the gospel with are some of the most educated and the smartest people. And the reason that is, is because they they think they have it all figured out when none of us do. Sometimes we mask our fear we think if we, if we are educated enough or if we're smart enough, we can work our way out of it. That won't happen. That doesn't happen. You can't, you can't outsmart the one that gives you the smarts to begin with. You can't outsmart God. God created intelligence. God created all intelligence. You can't outsmart that. But we try, don't we? But Nicodemus, he's educated. He's wise. He's, you know, he is, uh, he's respected by his peers. And he's coming to Jesus at night, coming for answers. He's not ready to accept Jesus yet. And we know on throughout that narrative there, they they get in this conversation about being born again. And the problem that Nicodemus has is, is he doesn't understand where Jesus is coming from because Nicodemus is thinking in fleshly and human terms and Jesus is talking about spiritual things. Things that Nicodemus should know, but he doesn't. And the reason he does it is because his eyes and his heart's been blinded by the darkness. They've been blinded by the world. And it's like he says later, he was in love with the darkness. And he can't see the light. He's not ready to see the light. But he knows there's more there. Now a lot of people say later on, Nicodemus receives the Lord. At this point though, he's not. He has questions. And that kind of brings us up to where we pick up tonight. He says in verse 16, this is what Jesus says. This is the verse that you all know. For God so loved the world, He gave us His one and only Son. And He says that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And we love that verse, don't we? But do we understand that verse and all of its parts and what it really truly means? Think about it. Let's break it down. For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. Think about that. What would you all give for your children? Your grandchildren? You'd probably give anything for them, wouldn't you? God gave His Son. Let's go a little deeper than that, though. We believe in the Holy Trinity, don't we? God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one. So if you want to think about it in those terms, God gave Himself. God gave Himself. You know, and you have people say, Oh, God don't understand how I feel. God don't understand what I'm going through. Yes, He does. He gave us everything. You know, we don't serve some kind of sky or uh, sky in the pie kind of God that's just kind of up there, just watching things happen. God's with us. When we suffer, guess what? God suffers with us. 
when we rejoice, guess what? God rejoices with us because He loves us unconditionally. You don't have to be very intelligent. You don't have to be very talented. You don't have to be anything. You just have to be a people. And if you're here, you're a people. Now, does that mean God likes everything that we do? No. There's been plenty of things that I've done that God has not liked. There's plenty of things that I'm sure I will do that God ain't going to like. Most of the time, it comes from right here. Me opening my mouth when I ain't supposed to or me not opening my mouth when I should have. But God loves us anyway. He loves us anyway. And He's willing to forgive us anyway. And He's not just for forgive, but He forgets it. Anybody ever done you wrong? If you've lived your whole life and nobody's ever done you wrong, you're blessed. Truly blessed. But everybody's been done wrong at one time or another. Now you forgive... But have you ever forgot it? That's the difference between humans and God. Sometimes a memory is a blessing, but sometimes it's a curse as well. It truly is. But God doesn't remember it. When we ask for forgiveness from our heart and we mean it, we repent, we turn from it, it's like the slate's wiped clean. God forgot all about it. See, it took me a long time to understand that because, you know, I can forgive. You know, I don't hold things against people. I just, yeah, whatever. You know, that's kind of one of my, that's my generational thing too. Just, we're, just, we're, the, we're known as the whatever generation. Do you all know that? <laughs> but, you know, it's just whatever. You know, just go on. Forgive people. But I always had a hard time forgetting about it because the next time I'd be like, mm, I don't know about that. Mm, yeah. And I was like, I don't know. I remember what they did this last time. I don't know if we should give them another chance. How would we be if God didn't give us another chance? And another chance. And another chance. And another chance. And another chance. We'd be in bad shape, wouldn't we? So think about it. God loves us. And if we accept that love, he says this, Whoever believes in the Son shall not perish, but have Eternal life, everlasting life, everlasting. And we could end there, but that's not where Jesus ends. He goes further because he has to clear up some misconceptions here that the Jews had and that Nicodemus had. In verse 17, he says this. He says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We read uh, similar in, in Romans this morning. that We're saved through Christ. He says, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And what he's clearing up here is the Jews had this misconception that the Messiah was coming just to save them. That God was the God of the Jews and nobody else. God was going to save them and everybody else was condemned. Jesus said, no. God is the God of everybody. God is everybody's God. Not just the God of the Jews or God of the Christians or God of, of, of this or that. God is the creator of the universe and God is everybody's God. Now whether you choose to worship God is up to you. But God is still the God of this universe. There is one God. All these other little uh, whatever you want to call them are not gods. They're false. They're fake. They're man-made junk. Your little statues of your little fat man sitting there like this is, a, is, a, is a, just a statue of a little fat man. It's been dead for 10,000 years or however long. Uh, he ain't been dead that long. But. Uh, or your uh, little statue, what's the, uh, there's a Hindu god. It's, it's a, it looks like an elephant with about 800 arms flopping around. <laughs> Junk! Muhammad is in a, uh, is in a grave somewhere. Mecca, I guess, is where he, that's where they say he's at. He's just a pile of bones. That's all he is. 
these little uh, the the Scientologists that believe in this the, that we're all possessed by aliens and they're controlling us and one day we're all going to be little mini gods and aliens and all the universe and all that crazy stuff. It's man made up junk. There is one God. There is one Savior who is Jesus Christ. All the rest of it is garbage. Don't fall victim for any of it. Because some of it's very deceiving too. Some of them will come and say, oh, yes, we're Christians. Oh, really? Why do you believe? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Well. Do you believe Jesus was born of a virgin? Well. Do you believe Jesus rose again? Rose again? Well. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Well, I don't know. If you don't know, you ain't got it for real. Jesus is real. Jesus lived. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose again. And guess what? Jesus is coming back again. That's, the, and that's, the, that's basically it. If it don't believe that, it ain't of God. And don't buy into it. But God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And, they, and, but, and so we're all saved through Jesus. And then verse 18. It's where people get hung up. It says, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now, if you say that you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you say that you believe Jesus, His Word is true, then why do we not follow this? He says, whoever believes in Him is not condemned. Good. Check that off. He says, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And what people will say, Oh, God's not going to do that. Oh, God's not going to condemn people. Oh, God's not going to send people to hell. Oh, God's not going to do this. God's not going to do that. Guess what? They're right. God ain't going to do it. It doesn't say, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is God's going to condemn. No. It says they stand condemned already. You see, they've made that choice to reject God. The choice is ours to make. God does not have to condemn. God lays it all out there in front of us and says, here's your choices. This is the way to go. This is the way not to go. You make the choice of what you want to do. And, and here is the reward. If you choose to follow me, you're going to gain eternal life. If you choose to reject me, you're going to hell. That's the choice. It's not God condemning. It's God giving you the choice and you choosing to condemn yourself. And if you want to choose to condemn yourself, then that's up to you. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're, if, you're, if you're old enough and smart enough to understand what I'm saying, then you're old enough and smart enough to understand that, that, that you're accountable to God. Because people always say, well, what about the age of accountability? If you can understand, then you're accountable to God. Now, some people, it's when they're young. Some people, it's when they're a little older. We don't know when. I can tell you, though, when you can understand you are accountable to God, meaning that you are accountable for your own condemnation at that point. You are accountable for your own eternity at that point. Your mama can't save you. Your daddy can't save you. Your granny and papa can't save you. Your preacher can't save you. Nobody can but Jesus Christ, and you're accountable to Him. So, and that, by the way, that's also these ones that say, oh, there's no such thing as hell. Y'all ever heard that? It don't hold water. It don't hold water. None of it does. So, why do people do this? Why do they make these choices to reject God? Well, it's out of fear. That fear causes some things. He says this in verse 19. This is the verdict. It's almost like Jesus is being the judge here. You know how they bang the gavel. This is the verdict, he says. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Their heart was turned away from God, and they love the darkness, and they, stayed, they strayed away from God, and they won't come into the light. They don't want to hear the light. They, they hide from the light. They run from the light. And the light is Jesus. They're running. James tells us, he says... Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. 
And there we are again talking about the same thing from this morning, being an enemy of God. If you choose to be friendly with the world, and this is what gets the church in trouble a lot of times too. We compromise our beliefs. We compromise so much because we want to be friendly and cozy up with the world. The church needs to repent. The church is not a friend of the world. The church is called to call the world out on the sin that it is in. To call the world out of it. To reveal the world to the world the truth of God. No, we don't be mean or snide or ugly. We just tell the people, what's it say? The truth in love. We love people. We help people. But we don't lower the standards of the church just to make people feel a little less uncomfortable. Being under conviction should be uncomfortable. That's what it's intended for. So, let's not fall in love with the world. James also tells them, here's the process here. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. First step is submitting to God. Resist the devil, he will flee. Then he says this, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Repent. Repent is what He's saying. You all talked about this morning in Sunday school. What's one of the things that main things Jesus went around saying? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He, we're called to repentance. We can't have it both ways. Jesus says this, and this is where I'm going to end. He says, everyone who does evil hates the light. And we will not come into the light for fear. And will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Run him. Hide him. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. See, the light reveals God in us. When we have no light, no God in us, we run from the light. We're like gremlins running from the light. Because we're afraid it's going to burn us, I guess. No, it's just going to reveal what, what needs to change within us. I'm going to ask you tonight, where do you stand with God? Not with me, not with anybody else. Where do you stand with God? Are you walking in the light or in the darkness? How sincere is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you willing to step out and to help other people? Are you willing to not give up on people and give them another chance and another chance and another chance and another chance in hopes that one day they'll approach you in the night to ask their questions, to seek out the Lord? And if they do, are you going to be ready to give them the answer? Only you. Can make it Father, we come tonight and I just thank you so much and praise you tonight. I ask you tonight to bless and be with each one that's here. I ask you to touch each heart and each mind, Father. I ask you to uh, open our eyes and open our ears, Father, so that we can hear you and see you, so that we can respond to you and only to you, Father. If there's anything that stands between any of us and you, Father, I ask you to remove that tonight. I ask you to, to purge that from our soul, Father. I ask you to give us the courage and the strength to... To let, let these things go, Father, and let the Holy Spirit penetrate every ounce and every inch of our being, Father. Help us, Father, to release all things to you. I ask you to be with us and just give us wisdom and, and discernment, Father. Give us the words to speak to others and the actions that you want us to take. I ask you to put someone in our path this week, Father, that we may share the gospel with and guide us in all that we do. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.